Well, thank you for inviting me and uh, giving me this opportunity to um, present some of my research uh, at this great conference. Um, it feel, feels good to be among friends and colleagues in the field. Um, so, I, so my name is indeed Rito Tensius. I'm an assistant professor from Utrecht University. Um, and today I want to talk about how real interactions with robots shape everyday uh, social cognition. And when I was preparing for this talk, I went back to, to look up the source of one of the pictures that I use um, during um, this talk. Um, so I use Unsplash, which is a great database for photos. Um, and in Unsplash, I search for social interaction. And then I got this picture. So these are people having a coffee in a cafe. Um, but these are just not only uh, people in a coffee shop. Um, because we can already see the near future of AI in this picture, right? Like, so a lot of people are using phones and other like smart technologies. Um, so we can state that the near future is already here. So technologies are everywhere. So I think it's critical to investigate the impact of our social lives, um, the impact of technology on our social lives. Um, so something that I term uh, contemporary social cognition. So understanding social cognition in this new light, in this era of technology. For example, since I'm interested in human robot interaction, um, I want to know when do you see a robot as a machine and when do you see it as a an social being? Um, what are the brain regions that are, are activated during these interactions with social robots? Um, so really, um, in order to understand the impact of a human robot interaction on different aspects of social cognition, we need not only to look at perception, but also real interactions. And I think like in keeping with the theme of this conference and the great talks by Antonia Hamilton and Emily Cross, who already showed that um, movies and other sources of entertainment and the arts can be great source of inspiration. Um, I highlight some of um, um, scenarios from a great movie, Robot and Frank, that will already uh, give us a great way of dissecting social cognition. Um, so with new technology, you can actually ask these questions on what the impact of social robots um, are, what the impact of social uh, robots is on social cognition. For example, we can ask like, well, can you actually collaborate with a robot? As in this case, uh, uh, Frank is doing with the robot or in this case, uh, former President Obama is uh, interacting with a Hyundai uh, robot. But also we can ask more complex questions on like, how do you form relationships with a robot? Uh, as Neil deGrasse Tyson is doing at the moment with uh, Pepper, the robot. But also we can uh, look beyond just like these positive examples, we can also look at the negative consequences of um, these interactions. So for example, there's a great scene in the movie Robot and Frank where uh, a group of kids is actually teasing the robot. And this is not actually fiction because there's this great paper that was uh, presented and published at HRI a couple of years ago where a group of uh, children actually ganged up on this robot that was uh, employed in the mall. Um, so, the question I'm trying to answer is like, what factors determine the outcome of human robot interaction? Um, so is it the robot, is it the human, or is it just like an emerging property of the interaction? Um, so building on our previous work, um, I reviewed together with Emily Cross, uh, the literature, and actually we can tease apart aspects that influence a human robot interaction. So we can look at the, the cues that a robot brings to this uh, uh, interaction. For example, the form and movement of a robot, um, the presence, so is the robot actually in, a, in the same room? But also we can look at the knowledge cues, um, the cues that a human brings to the interaction. So beliefs and expectations, but also inter-individual differences, such as anthropomorphism, which I will talk about uh, at the final, in the final slides of this talk. But more importantly, we can look at the interaction. So like, how does the interaction evolve over time, but also how does it change distinct aspects of social cognition? Um, and I'm taking a neurocognitive perspective on human robot interaction, thereby looking at distinct aspects of social cognition, focusing on emotion perception, the understanding of the intentions of other people, 
but also the feelings of empathy for someone else and thereby looking at behavioral uh, measures but also activity inside and um, brain networks that are uh, foundational for these uh, social cognitive processes. And this, the, the simple question we're trying to answer in these studies is if similar neural mechanisms are co-opted during interactions with social robots as with fellow humans. Um, so in the first study, I want to explore the limit of human social cognition by uh, testing the flexibility of empathy, um, thereby allowing to answer the question if a potential human bias in social cognition is the result of a phylogenetic um, evolution or does it have an ontogenetic origin? So is it because of learning and experience? So empathy for robots, you might say, like, well, this is a bit far-fetched, isn't it? Um, but actually, we know from study, studies by, done by uh, Julie Carpenter that even soldiers that are using bomb diffusing robots, they can feel a range of emotions ranging all the way to empathy. Because if a robot is um, destroyed, they will actually um, hold funerals for these robots. Um, they attribute all these human or animal like attributes to these bomb diffusing robots. Um, if a bomb diffusing robot is destroyed, they want the same robot back, even though it's destroyed. So already it gives an insight that maybe spending some time with a robot would actually influence uh, feelings of empathy towards this robot. So this is the question we set out to answer in this study. And Emily already um, uh, provided a pitch for this study. Um, so I can just uh, give you the, the details of this study. Um, so the question we're trying to answer is, if a five-day socializing intervention with a robot would actually lead to more overlap um, in neural mechanisms when you observe a, this robot in pain as when you would observe a human in pain. So basically, we're inviting people to the lab, um, scan their brains, present them with a robot that they will take home for five days and then would scan their brains again. Um, so we use a technique called repetition suppression, and I won't go into detail, but the main thing uh, to know is that it allows you to study um, neural overlap of uh, similar and dissimilar categories. For example, in this case, robot and human. Um, so we had this uh, little robot called Cosmo um, that would allow participants to have either free human robot interaction. Um, so in this case, the robot is recognizing the the student, Veronica, or you would engage in um, human robot interaction, for example, playing games, um, thereby allowing you to form a bond over the course of five days. And so importantly, these interactions would take place at the home of a participant. But you can also observe the behavior of a robot on its own. So the Cosmo robot uh, is um, triggered by internally and externally events. It has a frustration engine, so it becomes very frustrated if you don't interact with it for a longer time. Um, but this allows us to really explore how real interactions with a robot would influence uh, feelings of empathy at the level of the brain, but also behavior. Um, so to give a more detailed overview, um, we're interested in to see if after the five-day interaction, uh, the overlap in the pain matrix, which is a network important for um, when you observe other people's uh, distress becomes activated. If uh, overlap in this uh, brain region, uh, these brain regions would increase post socializing. So this is a bit of a complex graph, but the important take home message is that like pre socializing would expect that um, observing a human in pain and a robot in pain would lead to dissimilar um, neural patterns, but after spending five days interacting with this robot would increase the overlap. Um, so what we did is we recorded videos of a person experiencing pain or, pain or pleasure and a robot experiencing pain or, pain or pleasure. Um, so this is an actress. Um, so um, the stimulation is not real, um, but it will give you a good idea of what the participants viewed. And we created similar videos for the Cosmo robot.
And so then the question we're trying to answer is, well, does this actually, these five days of spending interacting with this Cosmo robot, does it actually increase the, the overlap um, in uh, neural activity when you observe this robot in pain? And as the slide already, um, the title of the slide already uh, gives it away, there's no overlap in neural mechanisms of empathy after spending five days interacting with this robot. Um, so this graph shows negative values would indicate less overlap post socializing. So this is not something we would expect. Positive values indicate more overlap post socializing. Um, and what we see is for these two regions in uh, the pain matrix, we see that there's absolutely no effect. Um, so uh, spending five days interacting with a robot does not lead to more overlap in terms of neural mechanisms when observing this robot in pain. If we look at across the, the seven regions of the pain matrix, we don't see an uh, effect of socializing with a robot whatsoever. Uh, so we can conclude from this um, study is that well, the socializing intervention did not lead to an increase in neural overlap. Uh, of course, we also looked at subjective experience. So for example, maybe you feel more uh, feelings of empathy towards the robot after spending five days interacting with it. Um, so negative values indicate um, the videos as experienced as more painful, uh, positive values indicate as pleasurable. Um, so as you can see, human pain videos and human pleasure videos uh, are rated as such. Um, similarly, a, bit, a little bit less, are the robot in pain videos and the robot pleasure videos. So we see distinct categories, but the important question is, does this increase, right? Like does the rating of robot in pain become stronger after this five day interaction? And actually this is not the case. So we don't see an effect uh, on subjective ratings of robotic in pain or pleasure. Uh, we don't see an effect of socializing with this robot. Right, so we can conclude, well, flexibility of social cognition, well, maybe empathy is a bit too far. Um, there's no difference in empathy towards the robot after spending five days. Um, so, of course, one could say, well, maybe empathy is the holy grail of social cognition. So maybe you should focus on a more distinct aspect and not something that's so fuzzy. Um, so in this next study, I did indeed did that, um, where I focus on the understanding of intentions and emotions of a robot. So basically we represented people with emotional phases of a human, emotional phases of a robot. Um, similarly, we um, presented them with a helpful or not helpful robot and asked people to um, indicate what the intention of the robot or human was. Thereby um, trying to see if higher order networks that are important for understanding hidden intentions of other people are also activated during um, uh, the perception of these intentions in a robot. And then again, asking the same question, does a five-day interaction actually increase the overlap in terms of neural mechanisms when we're trying to understand the intentions and emotions of a robot? But first, behavioral results. So, of course, what we would expect is that um, human emotions are recognized perfectly. So bright yellow colors indicate perfect recognition. So as you can see, there's no confusion whatsoever, pre and post socializing. However, there is some confusion for the robot emotions. So whereas sad, happy and angry uh, emotions are recognized perfectly around like 100%, Surprise, neutral, and fearful uh, emotions are not recognizing, not recognized that well pre-socializing. However, um, surprised emotions uh, of a robot are recognized better after spending five days interacting with this robot. Similarly, neutral expressions um, of the robot are recognized better around 70% after a five-day interaction. Surprisingly, or interestingly, fearful emotions are not recognized uh, better after this five-day interaction. But going back to the brain, uh, if we contrast regions that are more activated for understanding human intentions and emotions compared to, to that with a robot, uh, we don't see a widespread activation. So there's no increase in, in re, uh, activity in higher order uh, brain regions 
for human emotions or attentions compared to robot intentions and emotions. However, if we look at brain regions that are um, activated during uh, the understanding of intentions and emotions of a robot compared to that of a human, we see this widespread activity um, in a couple of distinct brain regions. So before five days, after five days of interacting with this robot, we see that trying to understand the intentions and emotions of this robot actually activates a core set of regions that we see in different tasks as well. And one task is that of um, objects, um, like perceiving objects compared to faces and bodies. So what we can see is that trying to understand the intentions and emotions of a robot actually activates object-specific brain regions. So brain regions that are activated when we perceive and interact with objects. So together with uh, Anna Henschel and Emily Cross, uh, we um, surveyed the literature and found that actually um, interacting with robots consistently activate object-specific brain regions. So be it during the perception of a, a painful um, stimulus um, to a robot, this activates the, the same regions. Um, conversing with a robot activates part of these uh, part of this network. But also, as I just showed, like understanding the intentions and emotions of a robot activates uh, these uh, regions. And interestingly, even a simple action sequence by a toy robot activates these brain regions. So, of course, this is cutting some corners, but one could say, well, maybe robots are objects after all. Or at least we should move away from human-centered brain networks um, and view robots as a more like neutral category. Right, so we can conclude that robots are trying to understand the intentions of the emotion of a robot consistently activates object specific regions. So what process do we actually use when we interact or perceive robots? Um, so when I thought about this, um, I remember that I visited the, uh, the London Design Museum where one of my favorite robots was on display. And this is a very simple uh, robotic arm. But when you observe this arm, you already attribute all these intentions and emotions to this um, robot. And it's very simple. And actually, this reminded me of all the great Pixar movies, whereby you attribute all these intentions and emotions to these non-human agents and objects, right? So, how do we actually attribute these internal states to these robots and non-human agents in general? Well, so for that, we have to take a step back and go to the foundation of uh, social cognition and social perception. And as Fritz Heide would say, like, well, it's all about extracting invariance out of variance. So variance is a stream of behavior or the, the ongoing um, actions of an object. And invariance is actually the hidden states, the emotions, the motives, the intentions of this agent of object. So how do we um, understand the mind of uh, humans? Well, of course, we use theory of mind. So how do we understand the mind of artificial agents? Well, we use something called anthropomorphism. So anthropomorphism is attributing human-like characteristics to non-human agents and objects. And the narrative in the literature is that this is actually an analog of theory of mind. Um, so together with Mikaela Kent, who was a technician at that time, and who's now a PhD student at Western University, uh, we try to understand if these two constructs actually overlap. So we really uh, wanted to answer the question if, the relation, if there's a relationship between anthropomorphism, so trying to understand the minds of artificial agents, and theory of mind, trying to understand the mind of a human. So of course, this is a very big project, so I'll only give um, some details of this uh, project. So in the first experiment, uh, we wanted to test if and how anthropomorphism is actually related to activity in the theory of mind network. Um, so we use the Party Cloudy uh, movie, which is a Pixar movie where a stork is working together with a cloud delivering babies. And this consistently activates the theory of mind network um, 
And we can actually use this to test if activity in this network is actually related to anthropomorphism. And to do this, we simply ask people to watch this movie, scan their brains, but also at, after this movie, complete a dispositional anthropomorphism questionnaire. So basically, we would ask them, like, for example, to what extent does the average computer have a mind on its own? And the next step is actually plotting the, the dispositional anthropomorphism rates for each participant and check if this is actually predictive of activity in the theory of mind network during this movie. And what we uh, observed is that there's actually no clear relationship between dispositional anthropomorphism, so participants' tendency to ascribe non-human um, characteristics or human characteristics to non-human agents and activity during this movie in the theory of mind network. So not across the network or within uh, the regions of this network. So there's no consistent relationship. But maybe anthropomorphism allows you to understand and predict the behavior of these agents better. Um, so that's what we did in a second question where we look at how situational anthropomorphism predicts the ability to understand and predict um, the next steps of these characters. So basically during the movie, we uh, ask these questions, for example, does the cloud have feelings? And to what extent would you be able to predict what the cloud would do next? So maybe situational anthropomorphism would predict our ability to understand the behavior of these non-human agents. And indeed, situational anthropomorphism is related to a better understanding and ability to predict the behavior of these agents. However, dispositional anthropomorphism is not related um, to the ability to understand and predict the character's behavior. So understanding the mind of a human and understanding the mind of an artificial agent are actually not overlapping constructs, um, but they are separate. Um, especially at the personality level, they might be overlapping at the situational level, but only one aspect of theory of mind because general theory of mind is not related to uh, anthropomorphism. And there's also some dissociation between brain and behavioral measures when we look at the relationship between these two um, mind perception strategies. Right, so we can conclude that there's no relationship between anthropomorphism and theory of mind. So it might be a little bit more complex how we try to understand uh, the brain or like the minds of the minds of non-human agents and objects. Right. So how can I, we actually approximate human robot interaction? Um, because right now these answers are um, really complex. So there are two strategies I foresee that will allow us to really probe the neurocognitive reality of human robot interaction. So one is embodied interactions. So where we move away from the screen-based uh, recordings of human-robot interactions. So for example, how you perceive a robot. Um, so get into like the first step would be these five-day interaction studies, but really the future is using mobile neuroimaging to really understand the neurodynamics of human-robot interaction. And together with a student and Hoheis, we are trying to explore this in more detail. Um, so, for example, we um, are currently completing a study where we um, test how humans and humans interact and contrast this with human-robot interaction. And as you already can see, well, actually, neural patterns are strikingly overlapping or are strikingly similar. So I think like embodied interactions, real interactions, would allow us to understand uh, the neurocognitive reality in much more detail than previously. Um, the final thing is inter-individual and data-driven approaches. Um, because if we look at the individual data from these five-day interaction, we see that there's a large variability in how and when and how long people interacted with this robot. Um, so I think really there's a lot of uh, ground to cover in these um, in the individual uh, approaches that can tell us much more how uh, human actually interacts with robots. Well, this will allow us to get towards a first understanding of uh, human robot interaction. Um, so, using focusing on the brain, distinct aspects of social cognition, and embodied interaction, 
we can actually try to understand real human robot interaction. Or as I would say, well, maybe we should like start with researcher robot interaction because over the course of the years, I've come across like many robots. So maybe I should study myself first before diving into the real world. Um, but without that, I want to thank you and uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks to all my collaborators and the students involved and the funding. Fantastic, Fred. That's, uh, that's great. And uh, the new results are fascinating. I think Thanks. I will actually um, I use my care privilege to ask the, the first question. So you, you showed that there is no such relation between, I mean, no direct uh, overlap between anthropomorphism and, and uh, theory of mind. Do you think that because in anthropomorphism, we also um, tend to rely more on a kind of stereotype heuristics way of explaining the entities which we anthropomorphize, like, you know, very template-like and not fine-grained? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, like, in the literature, people distinguish between weak and strong forms of anthropomorphism. Um, and maybe that's why people always thought that, well, maybe anthropomorphism is a way of um, theorizing about like the mind of a non-human uh, agent. Mm -hmm. So thereby actually using these labels that are derived from indeed like stereotypes, like um, you explain it using language that you normally explain, uh, use to explain behavior of humans. Um, yeah, but so, still in form of mentalizing, but much more yeah. coarse grain in the sense that yeah. here is the nice cloud. So then yeah. the cloud will do something nice, yeah. but, you know, more character, I guess. That's uh, yeah. okay. That's great. Yeah. Um, we actually have quite a few questions on the on the YouTube chat for you. So I will just uh, um, pick one relating also to anthropomorphism okay. and then you can go back to the. Um, so we have a question uh, from Jurgis asking whether anthropomorphism change human behavior. Uh, or, or you have uh, anything speaking towards uh, this, not just in the in the neural dimension? And if uh, if yes, is this um, also mediated because of uh, ability to predict? So, do you have any behavioral insight into this? So, so in this study, we don't have any behavioral insight. Um, so, we asked like uh, open-ended predictions. Um, so, at one point, we stopped the movie, and then we asked participants to. Uh, predict the, um, the outcome of the movie and here we also see that like anthropomorphism doesn't predict the the actual prediction the accuracy nor the reliance on theory of mind um, so i would argue that there's like a complete uncoupling between anthropomorphism and theory of mind on one hand so well, we didn't have any like clear behavioral um, measures um, but we know from the literature that anthropomorphism indeed like um influences behaviors towards these non-human agents mm -hmm. no it's very it's very interesting also because we've done uh, um, also some research on anthropomorphization not relating to robots but it's it seems that it also it equally explains capacity to dehumanize yeah. features so yeah. It could be that yeah. it makes people also more resistant to any yeah. attempt yeah. Uh, to, to humanize the robots, which yeah. which would then explain that it is no benefit in terms of theory of mind. There's yeah. so, so many interesting. Yeah, so you could see like uh, dehumanization as one side of the, like the other side of the coin mm -hmm. and anthropomorphism. So like on one edge is like anthropomorphism, the other dehumanization. Fantastic. I'm sorry we don't have time to read all the questions, but they're uh, on the on the YouTube chat for you to to check, and uh, people can follow up uh, about your research through your website. And you must be on Twitter. As well. Yeah, I will. And, yeah, I am. <laughs> so people can can follow up. Thank you so much, Fred, and uh, great yeah. great to hear your talk. Thanks.